I'm not sure my mic is on. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you all for joining us tonight. It's very, very cold outside, as you all well know. Um, so we appreciate your attendance. Before we get started, I'd like to have uh, notice board members that we do have a revised agenda that the item for District School Improvement Advisory Committee membership has been pulled and that will show up at our next meeting. So can someone, pre John, could you pre please read the approval of the re revised agenda? Sure, that the revised agenda of Monday, December 9th, 2013, Board of Education meeting be approved as set forth and that each item is considered ready for discussion and or action. Is there a second, please? Second. I have three seconds, thank you. <laughs> this is a roll call action. <laughs> Director Ann Halt. Aye. Director Witt. Aye. Director Westerkamp. Aye. Director Humbles. Aye. Director Laverty. Aye. President Meisterling. Aye. Thank you. Uh, next I'll turn this over to, to Dr. Benson for a superintendent's report. Good evening. Glad everybody came out tonight. Uh, throughout the week, Jackson Elementary School community is celebrating the 20th year since the school reopened. As many of you know, the school was closed in 1986 because of declining enrollment, but was reopened in 1993 when enrollment in the area increased. They have several special activities planned, including an archive display, student design posters, commemorative bracelets and t-shirts, and an all-school assembly on Friday morning. That event will include a puppet show and comments from former principal Carl Carlson, uh, as well as 2013 Iowa Teacher of the Year and former Jackson teacher, Tanya Johnson. Did I see Tanya come in? Hi, Tanya. Yep. Thanks for being here this evening. Uh, the original Jackson School opened in 1883. Several prominent residents, including Mamie Eisenhower, and Wilbur and Orville Wright attended the, that school. Grant Wood taught there, and that building closed in 1970 when the current Jackson School was built. Next, students in eight of our elementary schools will enjoy visits this week from college athletes participating in the NCAA Division II National Women's Volleyball Championships. Players will visit schools on December 11th to discuss their experiences with students. Eight elementary schools will have this opportunity. They will be Garfield, Cleveland, Hoover, Kenwood, Van Buren, Coolidge, Madison, and Truman. Next, the last of our scheduled magnet school conversations is set for Wednesday, December 11th. Community members are encouraged to join us from 6.30 to 8 p.m. that evening to talk about the possibilities of magnet schools in Cedar Rapids. The meeting will be held in the cafeteria at Washington High School, and Dr. Pickering has been doing a great job of facilitating those discussions, <coughs> and we will have a, a complete report to the board uh, scheduled for a workshop session for the second board meeting in January uh, on uh, where we stand and what we've learned about magnet schools. Uh, next, we will host the 2013 State of the District Report on Friday morning, December 13th, here at the ELSC. Community members are welcome to join us at 7.30 a.m. to learn more about some of the exciting learning innovations we are introducing in the district. We'll also enjoy some special student entertainment, as well as Dr. Brad Buck, the newly appointed uh, director for the De Iowa Department of Education, will be here and we'll give a, a short address. Uh, the annual COLA and Carol's program will be held at Kennedy and Washington High School Saturday, December 14th. The morning and afternoon concerts feature holiday music performances from those elementaries and middle schools that feed into each high school, as well as performances from the high school groups. Uh, we had uh, the Washington High School Madrigal Singers at uh, a rotary today. They were exceptional. Uh, Jefferson High School will host a similar event in February uh, scheduled to coincide with Valentine's Day. This reminder to everyone that district holiday break for students will be from uh, December 23rd through January 1st. Thank you. Thank you. Any board reports or comments? Gary? Um, yes. Uh, Attended along with several of the other school board members, uh, 
the Iowa Association of School Board annual conference. And as part of that, the UEN, also the Urban Education Network, also met. And uh, I attended their uh, legislative uh, priority action uh, luncheon. And as part of that, we heard that uh, the UEN is advocating for 6% um, allowable growth. Uh, um, they have three priorities. The, the 6% allowable growth, uh, increase in student mental health services, and um, continued work with student assessment, uh, in particular aligning with the Iowa core. So uh, we'll see as they go. And I, th I think Ann, who's not here, I think attended the Iowa, the school board associations, their legislative um, platform committee, and I don't have that report, but that was the UEN. Thank you. John? So, at the same time, that same weekend, uh, Mary Ellen and myself and the new principal at Kennedy, Jason. Jason, great. We uh, attended a recognition at the uh, Department of Education boardroom, uh, recognizing Kennedy High School for one of the largest uh, achievements for Latino students moving ahead in their achievements. So out of all the state of Iowa, there was a huge gain for our Latino students, which was terrific. So. Any other comments or reports? Gary? I just forgot to mention, though, too, we also attended, several of us attended the session that was presented by Mary Allen and Jason Brown at, uh, at uh, one of the breakout sessions, and they did a wonderful job representing the district and talking about uh, our program at Metro. So congratulations. Nicely done. <laughs> That was great. I, I attended that. That was wonderful. I just had a few things I wanted to uh, bring up. One is um, I got a note from the city manager that he received a note from Travis at Movado, which is a real estate research blog, and they released a study of the best mid-sized cities in America, and uh, Cedar Rapids is named number six as the best city to move to in the United States. So that that's a trifecta for us because I believe we're number one in the state, we're ninth in the nation, and now we're sixth in, mm -hmm. in a city to move to, which I think is pretty exciting for Cedar Rapids. Next, I am a member of the Eco Economic Alliance uh, Economic Council. They have many, many councils. And as a gift this year, and it is under $3, I will tell you that, um, they got candy bars. And you can see it's very nice, and on the back, it says, the young entrepreneurs at Metro High School raise funds for student activities through a unique venture, candy making. The robotic students constructed the mold, career connections classes made the chocolate, and art students designed and produced the wrappers. All members of all of the councils in the Economic Alliance in Cedar Rapids are receiving this as a gift, which I think is, is uh, a great, uh, just a great statement about some of the great things that we're doing here in Cedar Rapids. And last but not least, at your table and at your table, you will see an article that Alan found regarding um, uh, home, uh, how students learn. So, Alan, I'll just let you comment on that. Yeah, there's uh, an article here, and we get inundated with information all the time. And, of course, I was looking for something else and came across this. I was looking for um, the socioeconomic status and, and how uh, kids learn and... Uh, I was concerned that uh, that excuse always seems to fall to the top of the list. Uh, and this shows uh, the um, 25 things that happen before that occurs. Student self-assessment, self-grading response to intervention, teacher credibility, those sort of things. And I thought this was very uh, compelling reading because it, it really identifies um, a lot of other things that we do well. And you could start checking these off the list. There's a few things that we could probably do a little more of. But uh, we don't need to always put that other one at the top of the list. So I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. So uh, I think there's going to be a lot more focus on that in the upcoming months um, with regard to community dialogue and conversation. So I wanted to share that with you. Okay, moving on, we do have communications, delegations, and petitions. I do have three requests to address our board. And please come up as I, and state your name and address. And you have five minutes uh, to convey your your thoughts and, and comments. So first we'll start with Sue Clapp. Good evening, I'm Sue Clapp, 2242 Evergreen Street, Northeast Cedar Rapids, Iowa. 
I am pleased to share with you our newly named nationally board certified teachers. This year, Cedar Rapids Community Schools have six new MBC teachers and two others that have renewed their certificates. Roxanne Dittmer from Lynn County Child Development Center, Jessica Mooberry from Erskine, Abby Petchy from Grant Wood, Cassidy Reinken from Roosevelt, Jillian Schulte from Grant Wood and Kenwood, and Nicole Shaw from Gibson are the new recipients. Jeanette Schrader from Harding and Robert Thronson from Washington renewed their certificates, which re expire after 10 years. This is quite an achievement. <laughs> Teachers must demonstrate advanced teaching knowledge, skills, and practices, and should be viewed as accomplished education professionals. Nationally, the number of teachers who have achieved national board certification is equivalent to approximately only 3% of the teaching force. Cedar Rapids is proud to state that we have three times the number of those certified teachers as any other district in our state. Currently, we have 44 active nationally board certified teachers, plus our six new candidates and have had as many as 60 teachers that have now completed this process as one of the teachers in our district. The next highest total prior to this year, I don't know the whole state uh, results yet, um, is at Sioux City and they have only 17 certified teachers. So we have quite a big gap in, in number. And I'm pr proud to say that the strength in this program is due to the promotion and support by the Cedar Rapids Education Association and the Iowa State Education Association. We have three of our members that help to facilitate support classes and provide ongoing support with reading their entries. Um, Robin Gandy, Sherry Kopecki, and Chris LaFriends have currently been supporting our national board process um, and helping them pursue this very rigorous accompli accomplishment. Congratulations to these national board certified teachers. We're proud of you. Um, I'd also like to share that we did have six of our staff nominated for the Excellence in Education Award presented every year by the Iowa State Education, Education Association. I spoke with you earlier encouraging parents and staff to take the time to nominate some of our outstanding teachers, and proudly several of you did that. Uh, though none were announced as the top winner, I was pleased that so many have been thought of and nominated. This year, Bridget Castelluccio, from Jackson, Suzanne Clace Duthler from Madison, Judy Schinkelberg from Coolidge, Cindy Smith from Harding, Connie Stuzak from Jackson, and Jenny Wagner from Kennedy were the proud nominees. Thank you to those that took the time to nominate these outstanding teachers, and congratulations to our very deserving staff. Thank you, Sue. Uh, next is Tanya Johnson. <coughs> Hi, Tanya Johnson, 3816 Riverside Drive, Northeast. I didn't just come today because I knew Dr. Benson was going to be talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> Seems I'm always at the place where he brings my name up. Um, as the Iowa Teacher of the Year, I've been part of many conversations at the state level. Last week, I attended the Iowa Reading Research Advisory Council and the Department of Ed Division meeting. And a couple of items that they were discussing was the Collaborating for Kids program, which is sometimes known as C4K and the legislation that was funded in the last session that deals with the retention of third graders who are not proficient in reading. The Collaborating for Kids program is a program that I'm really excited about. As a kindergarten teacher, it gives teachers a universal screener for their students and some additional assessments to help teachers be more efficient in how they group students and progress monitor the additional help the students will get. But all of this is background information for why I'm really here. As the Teacher of the Year, I'm a voice for teachers, and many teachers I have talked to are concerned about their large class sizes. The only school that I have the specifics on is Jackson, where both my children attend, and my, both my children attended, and my son is in fifth grade now, and also where I taught. Um, right now, their kindergarten classes have 27 in each room. First grade has 23 and 24, and second grade has 27 and 29. This does not include the six students that are integrated, two at each grade level. That is an average of 26 students in the K through two classes at Jackson. I know our district has suggested class sizes for grade levels, K1, which is 21, two th two th second through third grade for 23, and fourth through fifth grade at 25. 
And we look at those across the district and we make that goal. I think we need to start looking at these numbers as each school because it is difficult to meet the needs of our students when our class sizes are so close to 30. In my own kindergarten classes, I had students that didn't know their alphabet and other students that were reading at a third grade level. So as we're asked to differentiate, it's really difficult when you have such high numbers. Now also at Jackson, the two teachers you just heard about from Sue, the second grade classes are using one-on-one -on -one iPads. So this is a great opportunity for those students, but it is also a challenge for those teachers to make that happen with such large class sizes. Right before the meeting, I talked with Mrs. Dusak, and she said, you are all welcome to come and visit her classroom and see the students working on the iPads and see her, see her room and work. Um, the Cedar Rapids School District does so many awesome things. However, I believe we really need to focus on giving our students in K through two every opportunity to have a strong start, and it is important that the teachers have a manageable group of students to work with. Our teachers work so hard that let's, we need to give them a chance to meet the needs of every single student in their classes. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Next is Lawrence Winklowski. <laughs> Hi, uh, Lawrence Winklowski, 4234 Moreau Road, Northeast. It was mentioned to me that I should not blame the whole board or administration for deficiencies of a few. And they were right, and I apologize to anyone who was inappropriately criticized. I have a good idea as to the communication standards of Dr. Benson and President Meisterling have, and I will continue to point out uh, specific failures to meet the standards, not everyone. On the Engage CR Schools, there was a topic, what teacher leadership roles would enhance your children's education? It took as many as eight days to answer questions, and when Mrs. Mosk uh, posted a response, the response did not an answer the questions asked, but repeated previous information and referenced House File 215 without providing a link to that document. If you want public feedback, provide the initial information required for the feedback, and answer questions in a timely manner. Mr. Witt, you owe me a reply to my November 17th email. Statement of person. PACT is one of my favorite programs. Larry, would you refrain from not specifically calling people out? You can just say a board member or something like that. We'll talk about that later. Um, PACT is one of my favorite programs the district has, and within PACT is the fu Future City Competition, which is a fair and well-run competition. This year, the competition will be held on January 25th at Prairie Middle School. If you have never attended a future city competition, I strongly suggest you go to see what middle school students can accomplish. Go to www.futurecityiowa.org for more info. I have some concerns about the PAC program. One is the impact the changes that took place a few years ago with the way PAC activities are scheduled, taught, and compensated for. I don't believe current PAC students receive the same quantity of program time as students who participated in PAC <coughs> before these changes took place. Scheduling is another issue. Mock trial ended a week before the competition, and future sh cities should start at the beginning of September, not late October. As for the mock trial competition, I suggest the district stop participating in the mock trial con competition. The district should only return to the competition when changes are made to make it fair to all participants. Some eighth graders cannot participate in PAC because their RTI time is in the morning when they are at high school and others don't participate because of the demands required on them by high school classes. We are losing participants, and we need to make sure PAC remains strong. This high school, this school board approved a calendar which allows two days for finals. So why does at least one high school allow three? Why does the amount of time the students have for, to take final exams differ between high schools? Is less taught at some high schools? 
why do some eighth graders taking high school classes at one school have to take three finals in one day, while their middle school classmates who goes to a different high school gets to take finals in two days? This creates problems for middle schools who have to accommodate students on different high school schedules and parents who now have to drop their children off into the middle um, to middle school at uh, 11 o'clock instead of at a high school at 8 in the morning. This situation needs to be corrected now before the finals in the beginning of March. Final schedules should be this, the same for all schools. <laughs> Even period classes one day, odd period classes the next. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is our consent agenda, and I'm going to do this a little bit differently. I'm going to ask for a motion, a second, and then we'll have discussion. So can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So move. Second, please. Second. And discussion. <clears throat> yes, John. I have a, a couple of items. First of all, I wanted to uh, point out BA 14170, the musical instruments. Um, as a parent who has children in the district who have been very active in music um, and seeing nationally that music programs are being cut. I want to point out to the public that I'm very proud as a board member here of Cedar Rapids that we continue to support uh, the music programs. Um, this is one example. We're spending almost $60,000 for 40 different musical instruments for our middle and high schools. This is uh, just one of a yearly allotment of new music instruments and things that go into our program. So again, I'm very proud of that. And the second thing I did want to pull the uh, PEPL um, programs. There's several of them, BA 14152, 154, 162, and 168. Um, as we've seen as a board, uh, there's maybe some confusion about what uh, the district's budget goes for and what these different taxes go for. The musical instruments are out of the instructional support levy. Things on the list in these items include asbestos uh, removal, parking lots and playground repair. There's a lot of those. Um, site repair for concrete, energy projects, exterior door replacements, gym wood floor refinishing, tech pointing. I've, I've heard from sp some specific parents where they've seen uh, cracks in the brick and mortar, and that's the tuck point pointing. Uh, classroom uh, contingency programs, roof replacements, access for safety and security, uh, sealing of tennis courts and replacement of vehicles. We also see window and door replacements. We see uh, trucks and uh, cars that are from more than 12 years old. We see buses on here, new buses. Uh, these are all things that the PEPL money is going for. So when the citizens vote down the renewal of the PEPL and look for that, I just want to remind people that it's pay this now, uh, make sure that we have adequate funds to support our schools and keep our kids safe in our schools, or we're going to end up paying later. So just want to make those comments. I appreciate those. Any other comments or items that you'd like to discuss in consent agenda? <coughs> this is a roll call action. Director Witt. Aye. Director Westerkamp. Aye. Director Humbles. Aye. Director Rosenthal. Aye. Director Laverty. Aye. Director Anhalt. Aye. President Meisterling. Aye. Thank you. Uh, next, I'll turn this over to Laurel to talk uh, to introduce our Community School Foundation. Thank you. Tonight, we're honored to have a couple of speakers from our Cedar Rapids School Foundation. Here with us this evening is Sue Pence who is the Vice President and Trust Officer with Bankers Trust and currently the Chair of our Foundation. Accompanying Sue tonight is Karen Swanson, who is our Executive Director. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. I try to offer a little good news as an interruption for your normal business. I'll try not to take too much of your time. I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here. Tonight I want to talk about being grateful. I have a lot to be grateful for in the last year. We've been able to give scholarships to a lot of people. Actually, 48 high school kids got scholarships last May. Uh, six of the staff members here got scholarships funded by various sources of our organization. A lot of grateful parents and educators over the years. We're very grateful to them. 
We have a lot of wonderfully generous donors. Highest on the list in terms of number of dollars and maybe impact would be the Giacoletto Foundation based in Marion, Iowa. They gave us over $65,000 last year that we did a lot of things with. One, as you know, is the student enrichment grant program that allows us to give teachers based on a simple application up to $100 for something they need in their classroom. We all know that every teacher spends way too much money out of their own pocket to do things in their school that there just aren't budget and nobody's to blame for this. We just don't have tax dollars to pay for it. So we're able to help in that small way. We also have over $65,000 spent on school project grants. You will see that I'm talking mostly from our annual report that y'all have received uh, electronically. You will get hard copies in the mail too. I'm really old fashioned, unlike this paper stuff. So that's what I'm talking from. We're also very grateful to Hills Bank. They very generously now for several years in a row have funded our field trip programs. Last year we were able to spend, send over 3,000 kids representing all but nine schools in our district on field trips. Our executive director had the great pleasure, uh, exhausting pleasure today, to accompanying her son on a tr field trip to the uh, Iowa Children's Museum in Coralville. There are lots of wonderful, wonderful uh, examples I could give you. We don't have enough time, but they really do impact a lot of kids. And I think all of us know people, I might be one of them, that was affected by some grant or some program that was sort of outside the school district regular curriculum uh, that made it possible for me to be inspired in a way that has led me down some paths that I've truly enjoyed. I'm guessing we have lots more stories in, about that than we're able to share or even know. We have a lot of dedicated runners in this community. They're fitness buffs and they help themselves, but they help us do the annual Lace Up for Learning event that we hold at Kingston every year. Uh, the net dollars isn't the hugest impact that we believe this program has. It's our ability to tell people that we believe in fitness, that we have lots of ways of getting the job done, and it's a great end of year celebration for that kind of programming. One of my favorite programs is the SAFE program. SAFE is an acronym for Sports, Academics, Fine Arts, and Enrichment. And it's a program that was designed right, primarily right after the flood to help kids who lived in flood-impacted homes or went to school in school buildings, facilities affected by the flood, but also at-risk kids who get to participate in academic and extracurricular activities that require an ex but uh, expending, expenditure of funds that their families just don't have. So we make it possible for them to participate in theatrical and musical and other kinds of programs that they otherwise would miss, which again, as we all know, is a huge impact on a young person's life. So I'm grateful for the people that made that possible and it was a lot of donors. I'm grateful to the community leaders. There were five in uh, particular who met with Karen and me and Jen Newman from the board uh, one day a couple of months ago to talk about the possibilities for enhancing our endowment. We're really interested in ramping up what we can do for the district. We're trying to find ways to get that done. We're grateful to Jack Evans, Libby Slappy, Kathy Hall, Dick Meisterling, and Hillary Livengood for joining us for a, a noon hour at who they're community leaders who have wonderful nonprofit experience and endowment experience and fundraising experience and uh, lots of activities with uh, schools in our district and kids in our district, a lot of more alumni. Uh, and they helped us refine our plans as we go forward in trying to enhance what we can do with the endowment that we have and how we can make it do more and be bigger. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention with incredible gratitude the staff of this district who give payroll deduction dollars out of their own pockets to our foundation to make it possible for what we do. For those of you who participate in that, we're extremely grateful and, and it inspires us daily to do what we do. We're very grateful to you, the members of the Board of Education, for the support that you give us, the facilities you allow us to use, and my opportunity to come to these meetings inspires me incredibly. What you have on your plates is way more than we have on our plates. It, it humbles us, uh, it inspires us to do what we can with what we have and do as much as we can to help you. So please, as you can and as you want, 
work with us as we try to make it better for everybody. Thank you. Um, for the future, I have a lot of hope in our alumni program. Karen has uh, graciously given a whole lot of time of herself and her son and lots of other people to begin a program to compile a group of contact information to make it possible for us to connect with alumni and them with us and them with each other. We think that in the long term that's going to make a huge difference in what we can do. And we found it happening in the flood and it sort of inspired us um, in lots of ways since then. But we think that keeping alumni in touch with what we're about and what we can do with more help uh, will head us in the right direction and keep us garnering the support we need to keep doing what we do. So I'm very, very grateful. I encourage you. Uh, Marcia Hughes has been wonderful at working with us on the alumni program and how to use that data for everybody's benefit and how to reach out and make those connections work for us. And those of you, any of you in the room who have ideas to help us continue to grow and do what we do bigger and better, we're very thankful. Thank you. What a great report. Thank you so much, Sue. The work that you guys do is tremendous. And I see each year you getting more engaged and more involved and offering more and more program for our students. So thank you for your hard work and dedication to building this foundation. So much appreciated. Thank you. Next, I'm going to ask Val to uh, introduce the Kids on Course update. Um, I have the pleasure tonight to introduce Beth Malicki. So Beth, you can go on up. Um, Beth is joining us tonight to share information about Kids on Course, which is funded through the Zach Johnson Foundation, a collaboration between Zach <coughs> Johnson Foundation, Cedar Rapids District, and uh, United Way of East Central Iowa. So Beth. Thank you, Val. Um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Thank you for being here and for listening to the work that we do. We're very excited to share it. Um, I'm the program leader of Kids on Course. I am a volunteer. Our structure is truly a tripod. Uh, we have the United Way of East Central Iowa. They're our fiscal agent, and that's the employee of record for our nine employees. We have the Zach Johnson Foundation, as Val mentioned, is our exclusive sponsor. Zach had a big day yesterday. Yay. <laughs> Way big day. Yay. Um, and chairman of the Zach Johnson Foundation Board, Pat Cobb, is here, and his support is instrumental and amazing. And then finally, you, the Cedar Rapids Community School District. You offer expertise, access, and support without which we frankly would not exist. So thank you so much for simply being there and allowing us to do the work that we do. You see the top image is Zach and Kim Johnson, the couple who have great compassion and a deep desire to support kids and families in Zach's hometown. That picture at the top is from our gala. Did I do that? No, okay. Um, the picture at the top is from our gala, and that is our primary fundraiser. In addition to the pro-am that happens the next day, that's how we fund Kids on Course. We're in our third year of a three-year pilot. Our new focus since this summer has really been pushing academic achievement, and we're in two elementary schools currently, Harrison Elementary and Van Buren Elementary. We started a summer camp. That's an example of the academic push we've been doing. We, not only, invite, we only invited kids who were academically behind or who needed a positive place to be over the summer, and quite frankly, most of our kids fell into both categories. It was free for all who attended. We provided two meals, transportation to and from the site, which was Harrison, again, thank you. We hired Cedar Rapids certified teachers to instruct in math and reading one hour of each, each day for four weeks. We had about 75 kids show up over those four weeks. We had 52 attend with regularity, enough regularity that we could look at data and say with conviction that our intervention caused that data to move or not. And we're very excited to say that it did move. Um, if I could show you a slide, and if it is not there, it is in your packet. Oh, there it is, yay. This is an example, that whole breadth of it, the blue and the red, of how many math skills kiddos should have had before they entered the next school year. The red, or rather, the bluish, is what they actually had mastered before they came to our summer camp. The red is how much work we had to do. Granted, we only had four weeks. So let's see the next slide and see how far we got on math. We got purple. We did 25% of math skills, either mastered or at least growth in those math skills, in four weeks' time through our summer camp. If you look at this sheet, and the board members received one. If you want one, just email me. Reading scores um, were not as vibrant. They were good. We didn't have the summer slide, but we reduced it um, closer to half than a third. Uh, so we were really, really happy about the summer slide in reading that we were able to sort of hold the line on and make some progress on. 
theoretically, if we doubled the program, we could totally eliminate you know, the math gap and, make, and potentially get really close to not having any sort of summer slide. We're in second, third, and fourth grades at Van Buren and Harrison. Next year, we'll be at second, third, fourth, fifth, and that's considered fully ramped up. Um, we also have, so we have four staff at each of our schools. We also have a part-time Hispanic family liaison because we recognize that one of our schools, Van Buren, we have a significant ELL population, and we were not reaching those families adequately, and we had to try a new method. And wow, shocking, um, culture matters, and having someone who understands their culture and uh, they can trust has made a huge difference. We know that real change comes through exceptional relationships. That example I just gave about um, the Hispanic outreach is a good example of that. But we are pretty intense about data. It is not good enough to do things that you think will help or things you think seem nice. You have to measure what you do and make sure it aligns with what classroom teachers want, school district goals are, and what will simply make this a better community. If I could show you a slide of something we look at pretty intensely, it's the one after this. It's demographic data. We don't hide from the fact that a majority of our students rely on free reduced lunch. We also don't use that as an excuse for why maybe they're not achieving. We look at racial realities and we embrace it and want to make sure that our program is reflective of the racial breakdown in the building. We want students because they could benefit from our program, not because their parents signed them up. Um, the next slide looks at assessment data from Iowa assessments last year. If I could draw your attention to the green line, that's kids on course assessment data. As you can tell at Harrison Elementary, based on last year's Iowa assessments, our students outperformed the, their co the second through fifth graders at Harrison, third graders as a district, third graders in the state, and low income third graders in the state. We only tested third graders last year because those are the only ones that could be tested. Um, so at Harrison, kids on course students had awesome results. I'm out of time. Do I have to stop? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the next one simply shows Van Buren's demographic breakdown. For those of you who are not familiar, Van Buren has more students who at home did not learn English as their first language than any other elementary school in the district. And we were having a tough time getting those students' families to enroll in our program. That's why we brought in our Hispanic liaison, and, and we're doing great now because of her efforts. Um, the next slide at Van Buren. Not as impressive, that green line. The IO assessment data does not reflect that our students um, were way out in front compared to everyone else, but we are pleased with the results nonetheless. It just simply tells us we have work to do. We're piloting, piloting a new way to do parent-teacher conferences. Um, it's called APTT. I can talk for hours about it, but I won't. It does give parents real tools in how to improve their students' academics rather than the traditional uh, parent-teacher conference, which is kind of like this. Are we good? Are we not so good? It actually teaches the parents how to teach classroom material. We're also spending $20,000 this academic year on mental health. We do not provide mental health services. We give um, grants to Abby Center, and they're able to do group therapy, which is something they're not able to do without these dollars. We noticed, especially at Harrison, there was a mental health need that simply was not being met, and we've had some um, pretty impressive um, results, not only in student data for uh, referrals to the office, but also information from teachers that the students who are doing these types of therapies are moving along in a, in a positive way. We do what it takes. The schools know what the students need. They trust us to do outside of that quality instruction. We do not provide quality instruction. We just do what it takes to make sure those students can learn when they're receiving it. Um, we're nimble. We are addicted to data, and that's why we believe we have seen some positive early success. While we are in the third year of a three-year pilot, we're not at the end, we're at the beginning. We're really looking to expand to middle schools, that would be Roosevelt and Wilson, and follow our students as they go into those more uh, tricky ages as they go through middle school and eventually high school. And we also would like to see our program expand to other elementary schools. Um, sooner than later, but we know the reality is that we have to do this uh, deliberately and carefully. Um, we are poised to stay with them through graduation day. Not high school, but college. Any questions? No, it was an excellent report. I want to make one more note about Zach's performance yesterday. <laughs> that was outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to see one more hole played, mm. but it, that, didn't, that didn't happen with the same outcome, I would say. Uh, questions <coughs> for Beth? Our annual budget is 350000 I forgot to mention that, mm -hmm. 175 per school per year, and that does support um, 
all our staff members. I'm a volunteer as a leader, and we have some help from the Zach Johnson Foundation for admin, admin stuff, financial stuff. So our overhead's very low. Well, I think we, uh, we all appreciate the partnership uh, Zach Johnson Foundation and uh, Zach and his wife have done a wonderful job uh, over these uh, last couple of years uh, and the uh, United Way stepped forward uh, and, and became the fiscal agent and partner for this activity. So I think this is just another fine example of great things can happen when good people come together to do it. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Very well said. Thank any you. any questions or comments? Alan, I think you had your... I always have a question. Um, you know, we introduced Spanish in the elementary schools, and I just wondered when you said they are having trouble there at Van Buren, how does that, how does our program help with that? Do you know as far as the... For Hispanic outreach? It's really a matter of um, timing of resources. We have run into that question where our Hispanic outreach person has said, should I wait for Bulky or for somebody to translate these documents or take this call? And I said, does the parent want help today and now? Well, yes. Then we take it. And the communication is constant between our Hispanic outreach liaison and the district's folks to make sure people don't feel like they're being usurped or that they're not in the loop. We also do things that, frankly, if your staff had unlimited resources and time, they would do, driving students to mental health appointments at Abbey, taking families to um, physical health appointments. We can do that. We have the insurance and, and whatnot to do that. Your folks, um, I mean, you still have Cleveland and Hiawatha and Hoover to address at the elementary level. Yeah, Alan, I'd just like to say one of our big learnings, and that's why we put a liaison on for uh, 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 Latino or Hispanic affairs, and we also put a Swahili speaking person on, is the, the parents really don't want to rely on their children to do the translation for them. Uh, that's uh, really uh, uh, not appropriate. Uh, even if they have full confidence th in their child, they may think that the child may uh, not make the translation perfectly. Uh, so uh, having an adult to adult to adult. Our adults to a, a liaison directly to the parent uh, gives them the confidence that they need to feel comfortable with the programming. Uh, and that was uh, uh, something that uh, Dr. O'Malley championed a couple of years ago and, and uh, really uh, has paid dividends for us. Great, thank you. John? I just want to thank you for all of your efforts, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, I think that uh, this data is amazing and I think it sets a standard for us and for other programs that we support for what we as a board really need to see uh, as we support these types of programs so kudos for that. And thank you to your staff for helping us call that data and still be um, respectful uh, of FERPA and make sure that we are within federal guidelines for obtaining that. Our, our Hispanic outreach gal gets 10 to 15 phone calls a day from families mm -hmm. and I just, I don't know about your funding, but I'm guessing you probably can't have someone who can take those kinds of calls times however many ELL buildings you have. It's just a lot. Yeah. Gary? Um, again, I just uh, want to extend our appreciation to Zach Johnson Foundation. What a role model yeah. you've made for the community. It isn't just sitting back and complaining or whatever. Uh, it's really getting in and, and uh, working with us. And I think that's the other, the strong point is, we've seen many programs that they want to come in and they want to advocate their own program and this is what it is and it has to be this way. Where you've come in and you've worked with us and jointly uh, being able to, to move <coughs> forward. And, and the fact of having the flexibility to see where our, our needs are and be able to, to increase the resources, such as the mental health. And you heard earlier the UEN concerned about it's a growing, growing need across the state as far as needs going. And it isn't just throwing money at a program, but ad additional resources uh, certainly helps. And I, and I think we are making, you are, and Zach Johnson, putting together a, a model that shows this is how we really, we can make a difference given the resources and given the, the right direction. So a marvelous program. Thank you. You're volunteering your services. We appreciate it and extend our, uh, our thanks and, and gratitude to, to Zach and Zach Johnson Foundation for the great work he's doing.
You've got a great board. Thanks, Pat Cobb, and uh, everyone else on your board there. They are fabulous people, and uh, appreciate your time, Beth, championing this thing. Yeah, well, it starts with the principals in your buildings and Val for her leadership. Um, they're the experts. They tell us what they need, and, and we try to make it happen quickly. So thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Kim, I'll leave this with Val to talk about the extended day program. Nancy Buckley um, is one of our extended day program teachers, and I'm going to have her sh share a few comments in a minute as well. I have the opportunity tonight to share a little bit about our extended day program, which is an opportunity that we have in every single elementary this year. Um, it is uh, We've had extended day in the past in a few of our buildings, and this year we expanded it to every building, so it was an option for every building. One of the things that we um, is really important when you think about our extended day program is we really try to look at who are some kids that really need some additional support in the areas of reading or math. And we tried to make that determination based on information we knew in the prior year because we tried to identify these kids right away in September. What are some of the kids that might have some trouble in reading or, or math? What information do we have in data from last year that would help us make a decision so that we can give them the support that they need right away? And that is based on a building decision. They, they do that looking at their learning supports information. They meet as teams in their PLCs and talk about kids that maybe need a little bit more information, a little bit more support and working on some of the skills that we have. They follow um, and, and, and work on all of the Iowa core standards. So that is um, an important alignment <coughs> that they provide for each of the program or each of the students. And it's specific to some of the needs that the kids have. Not every kid in the same group, in the same building would have the same need. So it certainly is specific to what um, each individual student needs. Um, and then the locations, like I've said, are at every building, and that is in all sorts of classrooms in our buildings and trying to find this, the um, perfect location to meet the needs. They've divided them into small groups across the building, or they're all in one room as well. We also, um, a little bit about the program, we, one of the things we did is we made sure that buildings kind of um, set that schedule. So they could determine, do I want to do it before school? Do we want to do it after school? What's going to meet the best needs of our parents here at that school? We also gave them the option that you could do it two or three days, and we have a variety of different things that are happening. And that was based on some of the additional things that happen in buildings. It could be that they have other after school activities or other things before school that they didn't want to make this a competition to something else that may also be happening that will also extend student learning. We do hire um, our own teachers. They're all quality uh, certified teachers, and um, they do. They are many times the teachers right there in that building, but we have hired from outside as well um, as we've been looking for any of the people that might be part of it. We use some of the instruction that we use right within our school day, but we also use some of the things that we've used that we know are quality. Um, and I'm going to let Nancy talk a little bit about some of the pieces that she's used in her instruction with some of the students. We provide a snack to all of them as they come. If they come in the um, yeah, afternoon and in the morning, the buildings had the decision if you're going to come in the morning, do they need a granola bar? Do they need something to kind of get them going before they would go to breakfast at that school? And then the length is typically about uh, 45 minutes to an hour. It kind of depends on the building, but typically it's about 45 minutes to an hour. And then the, the other thing I want you to understand is that we're offering two sessions of that. We did um, a period here from September to uh, right before conferences or right after. It kind of depended on when conferences were following for most buildings. And then we're going to start a second session in January. And we served in our first session over 370 students. And that, again, those are identified by the buildings. And we're looking at that data that we're collecting at the district with our Fontessa Pinnell data, as well as our district Iowa core assessment that we do in math. And we're going to be comparing that data. The other piece that we're doing is we're um, gathering information from our parents on how do you feel your, your child has improved? What worked well with you for the program? What pieces do we need to improve upon? Because we want it to be a program that is successful. Students could attend both sessions if they wanted to or if parents wanted that. It was totally up to the parents. But we also will know, know that we have a lot of new students that we may need to um, identify and provide um, services to. So I want to um, take a little bit of your time with Nancy. Nancy Buckley is a teacher at Grant, and she um, did teach one of our EDP programs at Grant. And so I'm going to let you kind of share a little bit. OK. 
Okay. Uh, we targeted second grade for the first uh, session. We looked at the scores and BLT met, and so we tar targeted second grade. And I would say out of about 70, we had 16 that we kind of zeroed in on. We had three teachers, and then uh, Kathleen Ziegler, also the coordinator of it, helped. And our rotation was excellent. They, the kids met in my room, and we had all four little groups in my room. But they first had a snack, and during the snack, they played a math game that Kathleen had figured out. Um, and then 15 minutes later, they rotated, and we had a phonics kind of word study group. We had a kind of a guided reading level group, and then I had the math group. And what was really nice was, you know, I had three kids in maybe one group, five in another, and it was so nice to see their confidence raising because they could actually do the work. A lot of it, because we have a new math program this year, we kind of extended that day and targeted some of the things that the kids were struggling with and just kind of did a little bit more with that. And um, then we would just rotate groups. And one of the things that we really emphasized was commitment from the parents that we want the kids every day. So if they couldn't make that commitment at the beginning, we kind of said, well, there are other kids that could probably take your spot that, you know, so we really targeted that, that they have to be here. And sometimes parents would keep, pick them up early and the kids would want to stay and it was great. So um, this next time, I don't know, we're having a discussion about having a third, fourth, fifth group. So we're not really sure how that's all going to work with um, the teachers that we get or whatever. But the second grade I thought was very successful. I'm anxious to do the F&P again to just to see We've had a break here, but hopefully that'll carry over and, and they're just a little bit more confident. And I know the second graders that I have in my room, because I teach at 2-3 this year, um, their math facts have definitely improved. So we kind of targeted that and we had them graph it every day and kind of look. And we met twice a week, so um, it, was, it was fun and the kids loved it and it just worked out great. So, you know, questions? <laughs> Questions. Thank you very much. That sounds like a great program and, and ones that our students will thrive and benefit from. So focus on that data as you had in there yes. to make sure that what we're doing, you're, in, you're intentionally measuring that and, and demonstrating that you're reaching those goals. Questions, comments? I think it's fabulous. I just, uh, if this thing expanded, I mean, how do we fund something like this? So it's probably the million dollar question. How do you how do you fund a program like this? We've got certified teachers working and, and you know, we got a lot of constraints and yet we're trying to do the right thing. Currently we're using our at-risk funds to pay for this um, program and you know, it is working, you're right. We're pretty pleased that we served over 370. We, we have the potential that we could serve about 500 in each of those sessions. The unfortunate thing is then finding all the staff that are willing to take that time because it is an additional piece. Um, it, it lengthens their day because they start their um, EDP program shortly before even their contract ends. And then they go and finish their day, their regular contract day. So that's one of the issues. But it is, an, I think, one of the things is we've served probably more kids than we have before. At 370, we were very proud of this year. And I think that it's showing that we're trying to meet a need. And we certainly have potential to grow it a little bit yet this next session. And I'm hoping that we can. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Yes, Keith. I have a, a question, a comment. How do we relate these things to our legislators so that it's in a succinct format that they can see this funding really does help children? It really does get very positive results, you know. Um, <coughs> Uh, you know, we look look at these allowable growth numbers and so on, and um, yeah, it's just frustrating. Mm -hmm. Well, so, I so we need to do a better job of telling them right. what we're doing and how we're doing it. Well, and I can certainly share it with the board once we get our FMP data and our Iowa core assessment data back on these specific kids. But that would be a piece. You're right. Um, that the data really, when we can make those graphs like Beth was showing us earlier and show the growth that our kids are making because they're part of these kinds of programs, that speaks for itself and that, and that we need to have the funding to make that happen. You're right. Um, us, you know, providing words and documents like that if they have that visual of, it, of the data, there's a number of kids, here's the growth we've seen, that's pretty powerful. And that's one piece I think we can do. And I think what's great about this evening, we see, you know, the private partnership, we see what we're doing, you know, with tax dollars, mm -hmm. uh, and both of them are so important to get 
to get involvement in education and what's going on. So, uh, you know, I guess maybe it goes over to Marcia, but we need to spread the word. We do. You're so, absolutely so right. We do need to spread the word happening. of all the great things that are happening. You're absolutely right. Others? Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And Nancy, thanks for coming out tonight after a long day at work. Next, we're going to move to administration reports, and I'll turn this over to Steve Graham to talk about the comprehensive annual financial report. Of two documents. I grabbed the wrong document, so sorry, I had to go back. Uh, you have in front of you uh, two documents at the board table, and I just want to let you know look at the cover picture of the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. And if you look down at the third photograph, you'll see Dr. Benson, our superintendent, made the cover of our Comprehensive <laughs> Annual Financial Report. Uh, just before uh, uh, Kevin Smith, who's a partner with McGlattery, makes comments about this, and uh, Kevin braved the roads between Kansas City and Cedar Rapids to be here tonight, and will be making the journey back home tomorrow. Um, just a couple of quick comments. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Sherry Lusky. Sherry's our manager of accounting, and I heard uh, Beth Malicki say, a lot, when a lot of good people do a lot of good things, uh, or good results come out of a lot of people doing a lot of great things, something like that. <laughs> Sherry does a lot of work and, and really works hard and puts a lot of time and effort into sort of the behind the scenes work to put this comprehensive annual financial report together. I just want to recognize Sherry publicly for that. Um, this is uh, the 19th submittal, the 19th consecutive submittal of the CAFR, and we have received uh, from both the GFOA, the, Gover the uh, Government Finance Officers Association, as well as ASPO International, the seal of approval, uh, 18 consecutive times. So there are uh, 10 other schools in the state of Iowa that have received awards from both GFOA and ASPO International. So with that, I'm going to let Kevin make some comments on the CAPR. Kevin. By the way, that's outstanding, Steve. That is truly remarkable, and your board very much appreci appreciates that fiscal integrity, and so do your taxpayers, so thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Dr. Benson, members of the board, uh, thank you for having me this evening. Uh, I've got a, just a brief presentation um, just to give the results of this year's audit. Um, the, we have met, McGladry has met with the audit committee um, several times throughout the year, but the most recent meeting we did go through the CAFR and the results of the audit in detail. Answer, answered all of their questions as well, but certainly if you have any questions this evening, feel free to um, ask me while I'm here. The, um, this is just a quick agenda. We're going to talk about the report to the Board of Education. Um, it's one document you have in front of you, and then talk about just at a very high level uh, the financial performance of the district, and then also summarize the results of the compliance audit, which is our audit over the, over the federal grant programs of the district. Um, this first slide here summarizes the information that you see in this in this report to the board. So I'm not going to walk through that report necessarily, but um, the, the first bullet there is, is a very important bullet. The, the CAFR that Steve mentioned is 100 plus pages of, of hard work that's put in by, by management of the district. Um, our report is two pages within that, within that document, and, that, and that, those two pages are very important pages because they indicate that um, that's, that's where we give our opinion on the financial statements, and we um, give the opinion that the, the financial statements are fairly presented in all material respects, um, follow all the governmental accounting standards that are out there and GAAP. Um, and so it was a clean or an unmodified opinion is the technical term, but it is a clean opinion on the financial statements. Um, any other significant communications, any, any disagreements with management, any other um, items that came up during the audit process you'll see in that report. Um, there were no disagreements with management. Um, Steve and, and Sherry and their group do a great job of being transparent with the auditors when we're here performing the audit. We receive full cooperation from everyone that we work with at the district. Um, so no difficulties encountered um, while performing the audit. There were a few new accounting principles that were adopted this year by, by the districts uh, as required by GASB. Not a significant impact on the financials when you, when you see some of the 
names of some, some of the statements in here and you look at some of the um, terms for certain funds equity, um, you'll no longer see net assets. You see a term called net position. And you'll see a few different, a few different classifications on your balance sheet, but, but not a huge impact on the um, um, financial results of the district. Uh, the one, there is a new accounting pronouncement that's, that's going to be effective for the district in 2015. I mentioned this last year. It's been coming down the pike for a few years now, but um, this is the, the standard that will require employers that participate in uh, multiple employer pension plans, so statewide pension plans like IPERS. Um, these, these plans typically have had unfunded pension liabilities that get reported in their financial statements. Um, but these liabilities aren't picked up by anybody as a liability historically. And now employers or state and local governments are now going to be picking up a chunk of that liability in 2015 and reflecting that liability in your financial statements. Um, the good news is that it does not get reported within your fund, within, within your governmental funds. It's just a government-wide financial statement. So those statements that you see at the very uh, front of your report that are a summary of all of the funds and activities of the district on the full accrual method, that's where that liability will, will appear. So you'll hear more about that over the next few years. Um, and in 2015, that will be a substantial liability that you'll see um, on your financial statements. The next few slides, uh, just a very, very high level um, of the, the governmental funds of the district. Steve is going to be, I know his budget presentation is next, so he's going to be getting into the numbers a lot more than I want to here. But this is just a very high level summary of all of the revenue um, of all of the governmental funds of the district comparing 2012 and 2013. So you can see that overall revenues were down about 2.8 million or about 1%. Most of the decrease um, that you see in other local sources and the federal sources are just reduced uh, federal grants. Um, as the stimulus money has really come to an end that you've seen an increase the past couple years, it's now you're seeing that drop this year. And then on the, the flip side of things, the expenditures of the governmental funds, um, you see an overall decrease of $8.8 .8 million, but, but there's several categories that had increase in expenditures in your instructional and support services. The decrease is really driven from that capital outlay um, line, that, that fourth section there. And in 2012, there were still costs being incurred on this building, and so you had substantial capital outlay in 2012 that you didn't have in 2013. Um, so even <laughs> though there was a decrease in expenditures, if it weren't for that decrease, you probably would have had an increase in your expenditures. And, and, and as, as Steve will mention when he's going through the budget, in the report, you'll see the general fund uh, did have about a $7 million decrease in fund balance. And the, the fund balance is sitting at about $3.5 million at the end of... 2013 in the general fund, so that is the lowest level um, in the general fund that, that you've seen um, at, at least in the past 10 years. And then this next slide just shows the results of the enterprise fund. So uh, most of the, the dollars are, are from the nutrition, nutritional services fund. Um, you can see that overall the operating revenues and what you get in non-operating revenues from the state, um, the commodities that you receive for those programs, is able to support um, these, these two funds, the daycare fund and the nutritional services fund, which is the point of an enterprise fund. You want those to be able to stand alone and be supported by the charges um, that are being charged to those programs. So that last column there shows that you have an increase, overall increase in the equity of uh, your enterprise funds. And then the last slide um, is the results of the compliance audit. The single audit is what the government calls our audit over the federal programs. And each year we use a, a risk-based approach um, that the AICPA puts out that, that where we have to pick a certain number of programs um, to test. And this year the two programs that were tested were the school nutrition cluster and the Iowa um, demo construction grant. And those, those two programs alone accounted for about 45% of the federal expenditures that the, that the district received in 2013. Um, we, we also we give an opinion on each of those programs to see if they do comply um, with the federal requirements that were required to test, and they were an un, unmodified or clean opinions on those programs. So no findings, um, also no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses over um, the federal grant programs that we tested. 
And in accordance with our government auditing standards, we would also communicate to you in that compliance section of the report uh, whether there were any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses over financial reporting. And that there were none to report um, this year. Things that have been reported in the past, um, there's a page that shows prior year findings, so you can see that those have been corrected. And um, very great news to, to not have to report any of those, those items this year. So that's all I had. I'd be happy to, to answer whatever questions you have. Questions or comments? Keith? I have a question about the IPERS issue. Mm -hmm. um, it's my understanding that's a fund we really have no control over. Uh, and first question, is this a federal, state, or regulatory type requirement? It's federal. So it all all state and local governments throughout the country um, right. will have to comply with this with this new standard. So then that begs the next question. If hypers were, God forbid, go broke, uh, are we in creating a liability for ourselves by putting this on our financial statement? And if so, should we be talking to attorneys about, you know, in employment agreements and so on? that we really were not going to fund that. Since we have no control over it, and it seems to me it's an issue we really need to research. And this liability does not change the way that you fund the plan or, or, or change Why? the legal requirements to the plan. But I, but I think that's the point of what the GASB is saying is that somebody's got this liability for this unfunded unfunded plan and that liability rests with the, the, the sponsors or, the, or the, the, the governments that are out there. So if we recognize that though, do we create another liability for ourselves that we may have to fund it? I mean, I think we need to ask this question. I'm looking at you, Dr. Benson. Yeah, I know. On, on, on this issue that we may have to change our employment contracts that, because I don't want to be responsible for something we have no control over whatsoever. And Another there's, stupid law. There's, <laughs> you're not the only one that, that thinks that. It, it, was a very, it was a very debated standard and, and under scrutiny for several <coughs> years. And there's a lot of people that aren't happy about having to, to implement this. Um, unfortunately, it did get adopted a few years ago and it isn't going to go away. But, but it has caused um, <coughs> um, state and local governments to, to, to review benefit packages in, in some respects. Um, the good news is that Iowa is not, although the plan is, is, is underfunded, it's not as significantly underfunded right. as some of the states that are out there. I, as I have uh, uh, understand the issue, the federal government through this process is casting a wide net over a small group of fish. There are uh, s some states where municipalities have their own uh, retirement liabilities. Uh, and, uh, well, the Detroit bankruptcy is a good example of that, uh, where there are uh, obligations to the Detroit uh, taxpayers. Uh, I believe our obligations are uh, rest with the state of Iowa, but I'll be glad to ask that question, even though we may be required to report it. Anne? So are we liable for that, whether it's reported or not? Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm going to find out. Find out. Okay. My belief is that that's a general obligation of the state of Iowa, the way the Iowa has crafted their retirement system, but uh, I'll check on that. Okay. Other comments? Yes, Keith? You know, I mean, I think it's a remarkable job that's, that's being done. You know, uh, <coughs> these are really coveted recognitions that, that we have. So appreciate the work of the staff and being able to get reports and that we can have confidence in what we're receiving is correct. That's really important. Couldn't agree more. And in every department, you know, all, all of our departments, it, it follows through. Our audit committee, I think, has been doing a great job. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sherry, thank you very much. It's a lot of work. We appreciate that. Thank you for um, bearing the weather to join us this evening. We do appreciate that as well. Thanks. 
And this is, uh, it's recommended that the Board of Education <coughs> approve the 2012-2013 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. This is a voice vote. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Okay. And Steve, I'll leave this with you to talk about fiscal year 2015 budget assumptions. Thank you very much, uh, President Meisterling. Uh, you all have, uh, Dr. Benson is holding it up, uh, one <coughs> stapled handout. The very front side of it is the PowerPoint presentation. And then the actual uh, budget assumptions document is on the back half of that uh, document. So uh, at any rate, we, uh, we begin sort of the budget building season. The budget season never ends. It's a continuous process where we continually look at fiscal 14 budget on, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. We're looking at changes in metrics. It's very data driven. But this is, uh, I suppose, the official beginning of the fiscal 15 budget season. We come to the Board of Education, talk about the budget assumptions. And so this has been sort of the tradition in recent years. We have uh, 10 budget assumptions that we'll review tonight and certainly open it up to questions and answers as we go. First of all, uh, the stable tax rate that we have in preparing the fiscal 15 budget will be a very important thing for us to be very sensitive and very watchful for. Uh, it, it goes without saying, our local property taxpayer is providing our resources at the local level and we're very sensitive to that. It's the mutual desire of both the board and our administration to uh, maintain the stability of that levy rate going forward. So uh, changes in educational programming, fund reserves, tax base growth, all these things have an impact on where that ending tax rate will, will, uh, uh, will lie. And certainly the Board of Education will see multiple uh, options in terms of a property tax rate as we're looking at the construction of our budget, which culminates on the 15th of April of uh, 14 when we certify our property tax levy rate. And this is just an, a, the trend, a 10-year trend of property tax levy rates. You'll see that uh, we uh, are at $15.48 now, which is still not as high as we were back in fiscal five. So you can see the, uh, the change over time in the property tax levy rate. And we're still looking pretty darn good when it comes to all of our 11 Lynn County School Districts. We are in the lower third of those uh, levy rates when we look at all of our schools in Lynn County. So a bunch of assumption too is that we're gonna see a moderate growth rate in our property tax base. Uh, the growth in fiscal 14 was 2.1%. The average growth over a 10 year period is a little better than that at 2.3%. Uh, we have a, a residential property rollback order which increases our residential class of property taxable valuation. That's going to go up 3%. We see, though, on the flip side, on the commercial sector, that the rollback order is going to reduce commercial property taxes by uh, 5%. And then we have a significant reduction uh, from, uh, from our, for our agricultural property class to reduce uh, by nearly 28% off of the, of the assessed valuation. So this is a calculation that we arrive at taxable valuation. All these things go into the formula, and at the end of the day, we spit out the overall change of property taxable value for the, for the district. These indicate the potential, certainly for continuation of low growth in our property tax base going forward when we look at fiscal 15 budget. And our property tax uh, base, you can see that growth in that 2% range over time. Data, 10 years of trend. Uh, budget assumption three is that we're gonna continue to provide uh, property tax relief through our silo fund. We have committed, we promised the voters uh, when we had our uh, silo vote back in February of 2007 that we would provide $40 million of property tax relief. Fiscal 15, we will continue doing that with $4 million dedicated towards uh, that end. It, it reduces the levy rate by approximately 80 cents. So it does make a difference. And uh, fiscal 18 will be our final year where we're providing silo tax relief. Budget assumption four is that uh, we now know what new money is going to be in fiscal 15. The legislature 
uh, made the determination that we would have allowable growth at 4%. Uh, we have less than 4% new money. We have uh, great news. We had a, a certified budget enrollment grow by 1.3%, 215 students. Fantastic. We've had the first time in six years we've seen that go up. And that's a very, very good thing. Uh, our allowable growth of 4%, you think if you have allowable growth of 4% and 1.3% growth in enrollment, why aren't we looking at 5.3% growth in new money? And the reason is because we are going to see the uh, evaporation or the removal of $2 million of the supplement state aid that we currently enjoy in the fiscal year 14. So we have it, then we don't. So the actual new money growth rate is 3.32%, which is still a very good thing. <clears throat> uh, and it, it allows us to increase our regular program revenues by $3.45 million. So you can see the trends in declining enrollment for uh, five consecutive years, and you see now, hopefully this is the beginning of a long-term trend to, s to show a growth of our district enrollment over time. This is an example of budget targets achieved. This is one slide, but there are many ways to look at this. This is simply looking at every one of our positions, all of our salaried positions, all of our hourly positions that we call FTEs, or full-time equivalents, in the general fund. And you can see at the bottom, we've got 2,287 positions in September of 2012. And we look at what the position totals were in September of 2013. It's comparing every position that we have in the general fund over a one-year period of time. And then we cast the changes in that. We see we've reduced overall by 67.3 FTE. And then we look at the comparison to what the target reductions were for the same period of time when we had a target reduction of 50.6. Now some of these reductions of positions were not targeted to be reduced. And a good example is in the paraprofessional area, special education reduced paraprofessional FTEs, but they did not have it targeted to reduce because special education funding is a little bit different than our non-categorical funding stream. So we're mixing a little bit in here, but the bottom line is that we have exceeded the target reductions, and overall, we've reduced FTEs, and overall, we're in a better position from a financial standpoint than we were a year ago, because we have hit our budget targets. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, going forward for fiscal 15, will budget reductions be necessary? Yes, they will be necessary in fiscal 15. They will clearly be necessary going forward. And here are three reasons why. First, we've had, again, as I said earlier, five consecutive years of enrollment loss. 1,094 students, 6.1% of our enrollment. And enrollment is integrally tied to the budget equation. Reducing students, reducing funding. The second piece is our low state, of, uh, low state funding growth. For five years consecutively, if you look at fiscal 10 through 14, that's five years, and you average the additional new money growth rate, we would average 1.1% annual growth rate. Cast against that an average annual settlement rate of 2.61%. And every 1% is about $1.4 million. You do that and aggregate that over time, and it reduces the reserves of the general fund. And then finally, the overexpenditures of budgeted revenues. Because we are reducing our enrollments, we're declining in, in resources, and we're settling at rates higher than the growth of revenues, we're spending more than the revenues coming into the school district. And so we have an imbalance. And when you look at fiscal 14 at the end, be, between the beginning and the end of fiscal 14, you'll see that we're consuming $6.5 million of spending authority to maintain spending authority in the current fiscal period. So we're spending down those reserves that we had gained over a period of time. And you'll see this is simply spending authority. This is not cash. Uh, Kevin Smith was talking about the fund balance. The fund balance is seen as $7 million decline, uh, as, as Kevin has alluded to. This is about spending authority. This is how much we have in the authority to spend. You'll see at the end of fiscal 14, 
we are predicted to be at $4.54 million in spending authority. We still have reserves, but the rate of decline is clearly there. So what do we do? Um, I think the final, point, the final comment I want to make about uh, uh, Assumption 5 is that it is going to be a combination of spending reduction and new revenues when we're looking at putting the budget equation together. There's some great promises out there. We're very hopeful in some areas for some significant new revenues coming in. It's too early to tell, but we will definitely have to make budget adjustments to put our uh, general fund on the path of long-term sustainability. Okay, um, budget assumption six. Uh, we uh, certainly want to look at our staff allocations. There were a few comments made about staffing at Jackson Elementary School tonight, uh, but we will look at those staffing allocations in the aggregate uh, across the whole district, and uh, we will pri or, uh, prioritize those based upon available resources and based upon priority. Uh, what we have here is just simply what was and what is. So we go back a few years, go back to seven, eight, and look at our uh, class size targets in five different uh, areas. You can see uh, over time the differences between where they were in 2008 and where they are at today. And where they're at while well, we plan our fiscal 15 budget remains to be seen at this point in time. <coughs> budget assumption seven is that we'll make every effort to arrive at fair and equitable settlements, given our state of economic realities. Uh, we haven't settled for uh, any of the employee, uh, employee groups at this point in time, so it's all on the table to, uh, to go through the collective bargaining process, meet and confer process, and establish what wages and benefits will be in fiscal 15. 82 percent of the general fund budget is wages and benefits, so it's a significant impact. And so uh, over the long term, we want to try to keep the growth of compensation within the growth of new money. And you could just see earlier the five-year average. We're clearly showing that that was sort of a flipped equation. Okay, I think I've already said that. The cash reserve levy uh, and, and budget assumption eight will continue to be used to provide for that fund balance stability in the general fund. We cannot levy a tax high enough to um, avoid a need to take a close look at maintaining budget authority. We can't levy a tax high enough to do that. But what the Board of Education has done is given great support to increase the cash reserve levy considerably uh, from the previous year. I'm just gonna move right to the slide here. You see, we went from $9.2 million in cash reserve levy in fiscal 13 to $13.7 million today. This is the primary reason why the levy rate went from 1517 to 1548. But this is what is turning the cash reserves of the general fund around. You'll see that our cash reserves in the general fund are predicted to grow slightly in fiscal 14, which is in the opposite direction of our spending authority reserves, which are going down. But the board support of increasing the cash reserve levy was key to doing that. So we are moving towards a better place in terms of the fund balance as we proceed through fiscal 14. And you can see we're well within the confines of the limit. The limit is $36.4 million, and we're levying 13.7. So it's, it, we're well within our are uh, the law. <clears throat> I'm going to grab some water real quick. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, budget assumption nine is that the district will continue relying on categorical funding resources. We have 40% uh, 40% of our general fund staffing is reliant on categorical resources. And that has tended to grow over time. We become, we're becoming increasingly reliant on those categorical resources. And each categorical program is to be fiscally sound within the confines of its own program. 
and we develop a general ledger chart, chart of accounts to be very close on what monies are spent from what bucket to make sure that Title I dollars coming in are spent for Title I services, dropout, et cetera, et cetera. Is that a trend nationally, Steve, this categorical funding? And the feds are saying this is the way we want to fund education or? I really can't answer that question, okay. John. I don't, I, I don't know. Okay. I certainly uh, would like to say that yes, that seems to be the trend, but I don't have the empirical data to say yes. Okay. I just, I just can't. Uh, and then finally, uh, we will continue to effectively manage all of our district funds. I've been talking about the general fund exclusively here, uh, but we have nine other district funds, and five of them are supported with local property taxpayers. Uh, Pebble is is a is a key one. Silo is a penny tax. Our uh, debt service levy and the management fund are all tax-supported funds, <coughs> and we manage all of them. We just spend a lot more time on that general fund than we do in other funds within the district. Overall, we've got a $267 million fiscal 14 budget. So we are significant, a very large budget. And so I guess that, that ends my formal comments, and I'm happy to answer questions. Open up to the board, John. So I, I know that negotiations go on and all these sorts of things, but we heard about class size. <laughs> I've heard this from a couple of people in the community. I've heard it from some teachers. I've heard it um, from a my own children in a couple of cases. Um, so I see at the elementary levels, you know, these numbers 21 to 23 per class <coughs> size, and we heard of a class size in those K2 levels of 27 or 28. So if we as a board wanted to bring down all class sizes, I mean, these are averages, but if we said we want to cap all K-2 classes at 24 or 25 or whatever it would be, obviously there's a cost to that because it would take additional faculty resources to do that. Is there some way for us to um, get some estimates of what that would cost? And again, as we go into uh, discussions of the budget, obviously if you're getting X percent of new monies coming into the district and you know salaries are negotiated much higher than that it's not going to be possible uh, with 80 some percent of the general funds going towards salary and benefits but uh, I think as a board that would be helpful for us if we really want to get at this class size issue if that's a true interest and we have to pay for it how do we do that so at least as one board member I'd like yeah. to see that the answer is yes, clearly we can quantify what you've just asked, John, and uh, yep. Okay. And, and I would like to see that as well. I see a yeah. lot of nodding heads, yeah, so we we'd like would. to see some options for reducing those class sizes, and I'd, I'd say K2. Mm -hmm. uh, Anne. Well, yeah, just related to that, though, is, is I'm, I guess I'm not, I, I'm not sure to say that the data doesn't support smaller class sizes or that the data is mixed on the benefit of class size. I mean, I, I agree that having smaller class sizes is better, at least it's intuitive. I'm just not sure what the data says about how that impacts student achievement. And so if we're looking at where to spend our money on student achievement, we have to take. Let's bring that into the equation. We have to equation. look at the whole spectrum of where is the best place to put our money and whether it's some of the programs we heard about tonight or whether it's on reducing class size, all, mm -hmm. all that's part of the factor. I, I don't want to just focus it on one thing if it's not the most strategic. I wear my CFO cap. <laughs> I, I will be happy to answer questions from a financial perspective, but uh, far be it from me to be able to provide a quality answer. I look at our, uh, you know. Well, I was looking at them. <laughs> yeah, Val, Mary Ellen, yeah. jump right up there. <laughs> well, and, and the impact of Paris as well. You know, right. it's, it's the whole mix of what's right. in the classroom as far as professionals. And well, and then we're also limited by space in some of our schools. Yep. You, you can't just add another classroom of students because there's not physical space. And, Mm -hmm. We just want to explore those opportunities. Right. Okay. Other comments? Gary? Um, we start off with that uh, our, our spending down of uh, spending authority or reduction of spending authority, as I look at the chart, it, it's a direct result of the across the board state cuts that we had um, and um, a reduction of the of what is now called state supplemental support funding used to be allowable growth, a reduction of it. 
it just transferred the burden from the state back to the local and for us to try to recoup that. Um, so as we see a growth in, uh, <coughs> the next statement would be the spending authority will increase as we see student, our student enrollment grow up. So we have some control of, excuse me, over that and then it becomes a legislative of what we see with the supplemental growth. Um, Something that's not pointed out here, I think, and the assumptions are, uh, would be the, the higher down savings that we'll see uh, with a significant, I would anticipate, um, retirement this year because of some changes in benefits. There are certainly uh, some hopeful signs ahead for us, uh, uh, Director Anhalt. The fiscal 14 trend from beginning to the end of the fiscal year is undeniable and no matter what happens with the incremental changes that we will see in fiscal 15 higher down savings is a key element no doubt about it the growth of enrollment is a key element key grants that would bring, bring potentially significant resources to the school district and provide for additional spending authority revenues is a key element as well you'll be <coughs> seeing a um, a presentation in January for a, an insurance equipment breakdown program that provides for resources within the general fund and you'll make the determination whether that's appropriate. All these things are elements in fiscal 15 going forward but the the dynamics of fiscal 14 are what they are. The trend is what it is and it is up to us to look at both the revenue side and the expense side to, uh, to provide for a balance in the equation that we'll, we'll need going forward in fiscal 15. I just wanted to follow with my last comment was the staff's, uh, the class size allocations, and uh, again, what, referring to what John says. And I, I know there's quite a national debate on whether or not class size has a direct impact. But I know through talking with pro our professional staff, talking with our community, it is a concern uh, whether or not uh, it's perceived or not, it's perceived by our parents that the class size has an impact. So as we heard the good things about our community and it's being ranked nationally and state as a place to live, I think part of that, a good part of it is the educational system that we have. So uh, I think uh, it's a fine line, but I think we need to really look at it addressing how we can hold those class sizes down. I think it'll strengthen our district. Other comments? You know, it's always a, you know, we're, we're trying to be innovative. We're trying to move the needle on student achievement. It's a fine balance. Our toes are on the line. We understand that. Um, uh, so we're sensitive to this, this presentation, and I think we have opportunity still ahead of us. Thank you for your thoroughness and report. We appreciate the information very much. Okay, next I'm going to turn it over to Laurel to talk about policy manual review and revision. Thank you. The Policy Review Committee t is bringing you tonight a Policy 407 on homework and three regulations that deal with a voluntary incentive program that uh, correspond with the policies that you approved earlier in the consent agenda. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Just a heads up, too, we're bringing a, um, a whole slew of <laughs> policy regulations procedures for you to review in January. So. We don't know how to define <laughs> <laughs> it's a great committee that does a lot of hard work, so we're looking forward to bringing it forward. I, 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 did, I did have some questions about why we are eliminating some of that language in the homework. Um, you know, developing critical thinking and information processing skills, establish work habits and study skills. So what was, what was the context of the conversation that would lead to eliminating that? And, um, and you know, if you're not prepared to answer that tonight, you can get back to me at a later date. Jill and Mary Ellen really were responsible for kind of um, bringing this forward. I don't, Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen. What I would say is that when we um, discussed the homework, um, when we had the homework conversation, homework. Um, is a relevant part of an extension of the classroom. What it should, it is not an integral part. The word integral means that it is 
probably more important than it actually is. The most important part of instruction is when, that, when that, there's that interaction between the teacher and the student in the classroom. Um, homework and follow-up learning is not necessarily the integral part of, of our learning program. So I think that's why we took that. It is a relevant and purposeful extension of what takes place in the classroom. And I think that's really important that we have that wording in there, that it is um, not something that's to be done separate from what happens in the classroom. It is to be done as an extension of that and to further a student's knowledge. We know that we have students that come to us at all varying levels. And an extension of that for one student may look different than an extension for another student. We want to make sure that it's not busy work, that kids are just doing busy work at home. We want to make sure that they're expanding um, on the knowledge that they've gathered in the classroom and it increases their knowledge and their concept formation um, to bring back to the classroom. What we don't want is um, we know that the playing field is not even for all children when homework goes home and some children get a lot of support with homework and others don't. So it's important to us that it be um, an extension once again and not something that is just for children to do um, at home um, and realizing that students have different experiences in their home. Mm -hmm. Is there data that supports that? What, what's, what's the data out there that supports homework, the concept, all of the skills associated with homework? I, I, or is this there is, Mary, you would find it on both sides of the uh, line. Some people would say that there is no benefit to homework, or as others would say that it, it does benefit. The research that's been done at the elementary level specifically um, kind of leans towards the side of it's good to develop those habits. Does it enhance the student learning? A lot of the research would say no on that. That's probably the majority of it. Um, it does help to build those habits and help kids um, further their knowledge in many ways. Now I think with um, the opportunities that we have with Canvas to ex expand learning beyond the classroom and the resources that are at students' fingertips, I think again, that's gonna look different because um, teachers can communicate with students you know, almost 24 seven with the Canvas learning and kids can get on the internet and look at the resources that teachers have posted and so on and so forth. So homework is going to look a lot different than it has in the past with just going home and, and doing that work. Um, you're going to find research to support it, and you're going to find research that doesn't support it. I think the, the most important thing for us to remember is that it should not be, it has to be connected, purposeful, and meaningful to what has occurred in the classroom. I want you to say that in there. I want you to say that sentence right in that policy. Connected, purposeful, mm -hmm. and meaningful? Yeah. It is it not in there? It says relevant and purposeful. Yeah, I, I just, it's just, it's almost like um, when I read this, it just, I get, I'm not getting the same sense that I'm getting in the conversation that you're, you're or the explanation that you're sharing tonight. So we could, we could go back and look at that one? We sure. Can. Sure. sure. Absolutely. Mary, Mary, I got a question on this. Um, and maybe Trace Pickering can weigh in. You know, this homework thing has been a, Something I've always wondered if our district is moving quickly away from homework, and I don't know what it's called for sure, but it's the idea that the kids flipping the classroom, which I've said before, and I know we do some of that, but you get the kids to do the work ahead of time, and they are prepared to discuss it, and then you have a facilitation process. I know we're moving that direction, and I know with the magnet schools there's more of that there, but I just wonder if this, this entire paragraph could be enhanced to really talk about a 21st century school and, and all the things that we're doing, because this looks like we're just kind of doctoring up a little bit of something that was written in the 1970s when I went to school. And I just thought, you know, with Mary's comment there, that there might be an opportunity to really talk about the Canvas system and, and the 24-7 that you talked about and the idea that we, we really want these students to be much more mindful that this isn't busy work, because they still see it that way, and they don't come away with great study habits. In other words, the key is that when they're in high school particularly and they are doing homework, that they are, they're not just going through the motions, they're actually creating a behavior that will carry them through life. And that is the, the piece that might be missing here is this idea that you get people who are really clued in that this is not just to get through this day and so you can get through the next day, it's a change of behavior. I, I agree. I'd like to see that future thinking and mm -hmm. was thinking about flipped classrooms exactly and how that plays into this. So, 
Excellent. Great suggestions. And, and I'm just not sure if homework's even the right title. Yeah. <clears throat> learning to a I mean, greater. It's, it's all about moving kids to say, hey, I'm not going to school just to go to school. I'm going to school to learn, and I have a role in what I learn. And I think that's, that's what I'm hearing up here. The home school connection. We can work on that. Sure. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Okay. Good. Um, other comments on any of the other um, policy manual items? I, I would like to see in the future when we have these, um, like the voluntary, um, when we show all of this, you know, lined out. I didn't say that correctly, but you know what I mean. I would really like you to see a summary page. This is what has changed from this policy to this policy. Because it requires me to read all of it, every word, and figure out, okay, what, what changed there? So I don't know about everybody else, but I think it would be more helpful if we had just some kind of summary page of the changes. Yeah, those six documents are a little cumbersome. We could do that with those. Yeah. Thank you. We would appreciate <coughs> it. Okay, Some any other so comments or yeah. suggestions? If not, uh, this is our last meeting of the year. We thank, I'm sorry, Dave. Just a reminder for the board, for your calendars, make sure that you uh, have January 9th, the Kirkwood <coughs> Community College board meeting. Uh, that's a, a going to be a first, a great opportunity for uh, the largest uh, K-12 public to meet with uh, our wonderful partner at Kirkwood and, and create relationships and understanding. Yep. yep. Mark your calendars. Um, thank you for all the great work that you've done this year. We so very much appreciate your time, your attention, uh, this focus on student achievement. We know that you're out there working and, and doing wonderful things. So it's our opportunity to say thank you. We hope all of you have a wonderful and safe holiday. And we will see you after the first of the year. We stand adjourned. Thank you.